For some Sydney ciders, Boxing Day is a chance to slow down and relax. Hectic holiday celebrations winding down for another year. For many more, it's the focus of the festive period. One of the biggest and best attended events in the nation's sporting calendar, only now just beginning. 73, 2GB. We've been waiting for this. It's race day. The 74th Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race will be underway soon. And what a fleet we've got this year. Five of the world's most competitive maxis just waiting to be unleashed. There's Comanche desperate to hold on to the Lion Honours title they won last year at the expense of Wild Oats 11. Eight times former winners and one of the biggest names in Australian sport. Then there's Blackjack, Peter Harburg's challenger, a big threat in lighter conditions. Alongside them, the venerable InfoTrack, the former perpetual loyal she won it a couple of years ago. Let's not forget Scallywag, also highly successful as Ragamuffin 100. For the overall title, well, it's hard to look past Matt Allen's itchy barn, the 2017 winners who've swept all before them in the 12 months since. And don't rule out Stacey Jackson's team on Wild Oats 10. An outstanding crew, they could well be staking a claim for the overall prize in Hobart. It's time to sit back and let the race unfold. We are in for a treat. The Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. This is Steve on Sydney's 2GB. It's nearly four years since Mark Richards' crew on Wild Oats 11 won the last of their eight Line Honours titles. A damaged mainsail ended their challenge in 2015. A broken hydraulic ram intervened 12 months later. This is close. Oh. Oh. Protest! Protest, they're calling. But it was their near collision with LDV Comanche at the start of last year's race that proved most costly of all. Their rival's subsequent protest denying them a ninth victory and a new race record. Everyone's a genius in hindsight. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. You've got the armchair admirals and all those sorts of things going on over the last 12 months. It was a shame, you know, we could have done that penalty turn and there's so many things we could have done. At the end of the day, mate, I'm the skipper. You know, the, the, the final decision's mine, you know, and I made a mistake last year, but I look forward, not back, and, uh, you know, it's all about moving forward for me. Developing a new head sill package to reduce Comanche's advantage in reaching conditions has been the team's primary focus. But this year, their 13-year-old boat faces competition from every quarter. There's six Grand Prix Maxes in the world. You know, Leopard's the only boat missing here. The other five top boats are here in Sydney. I mean, it's amazing for the sport, amazing for the Rolex Sydney and the Hobart Yacht Race. They're all backed by great teams, and um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a real challenge. People think, oh well, it's a, the biggest boat wins, and that's great. But uh, if any of these boats went to Europe uh, or America, they'd dominate. If you look through the crew list, these five boats have got the who's who of offshore sailing. Matt Allen's team on Itchy Barn is no less distinguished. First or second in every race they've entered in the last 12 months, they're strongly tipped to become the first crew in over 40 years to retain the overall title. The teamwork on these boats is really important. When the weather gets rough, water are flying everywhere, solid and spray. So you've really got to have well-practiced routines that you can perform in day or in nighttime conditions in any weather and with very little communication. This year's race looks like it's going to be a bit slower than last year's race, but we broke all the records last year. And then we get that prefrontal trough intervening. There's going to be an interesting trough on the 27th. It looks like it's going to advantage the bigger boats. Boats down at around about the 50 to 70 foot range are probably going to get through with a nice timing down at uh, Tasman Island with that front on the 28th. Newly refurbished and resplendent, the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia is again the departure point for most of the 85 boats entered in this year's event. Friends, family and race fans thronging the pontoons to wave the crews off as they head for the start line. Ahead of them is an encouraging 10 to 15 knot northeasterly breeze, a spectacular spectator fleet and beyond.
a 628 nautical mile adventure to Hobart. Dennis O'Neill says go, and the fleet are on their way to Hobart for the 74th edition. Wild Oats 11 really looks like they've nailed it this year. They have great speed. Yes, I like what I saw from Wild Oats. He's the sheep, he's the sheep. They're all fully powered up here. I think Blackjack's grabbed the lead here. And there she goes, the turning mark. Yeah, just go, 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 go. Meanwhile, Comanche, well yeah. behind. Blackjack is away in the 74th Rolex Sydney Hobart. Look at that lead. The Spectator fleet is still with them. It's just a mass of white water down to Lewis. Charging after the Maxis is an 80-strong pack of leading contenders and outside bets. Already in the mix are the near sister ships, the all-female crewed Wild Oats 10 and the Tasmanian Hope, Philip Turner's Alive. Also prominent, Matt Allen's men on Itchy Barn, well prepared for the challenge ahead of them. Behind them, a diverse array of yachts, big and small. Classic and modern. Their crews from far and wide, both professional and Corinthian. All with one goal, to complete the course and win or lose, to savour the taste of adventure. The clamour of Sydney Harbour quickly receding. The race route takes the fleet down the coast of New South Wales and out into the unpredictable Bass Strait. After crossing that and tracking down the east coast of Tasmania, there's still Storm Bay to negotiate. And finally, the fickle breezes of the Derwent River, where many a challenge has foundered. David Witt and his crew's campaign on Son Hung Kai's scallywag ends much earlier. Just a few hours into the race, a broken bowsprit forces the Hong Kong entry's retirement. Leaving the field to the four remaining maxis, revelling in the building northeasterlies. Among them is Christian Beck's InfoTrack, 2016 Line Honours winner as Perpetual Loyal and again a serious contender in the hands of an experienced crew determined to return her name to the honours board. Up ahead and setting the early pace as expected is Comanche, the newest of the 100-footers streaking their way south to Hobart. Famed for her exploits as the world's fastest monohull, she was acquired a little over a year ago by Jim Cooney. A renewable energy entrepreneur, well versed in the art of harnessing the power of the wind. The technology that we use in wind farms has helped me understand some of the performance issues that you experience on a big boat like this. This boat's made entirely of carbon and wind turbine blades are made of carbon. And a wind turbine generates enormous power when the wind is blowing, but when the wind blows too strongly, you need to feather the blades just as we shorten sails. So there's a lot of good parallels between the wind industry and sailing a boat. A structural engineer by training, Cooney and his companies have developed sites on three continents, including this one at Brockaboy in Northern Ireland, where just 19 wind turbines generate sufficient electricity in typical conditions to power 28,000 homes. With wind turbines, this was the first time that we built something that was 80 metres tall with a 30-tonne moving mass on the top. And that brought with it a whole new set of dynamics. It's very similar with big boats like Comanche with enormous writing moment and the power that the sails generate changes the way you approach it. It's not just bigger, it's a, a different structural analysis and a different approach to design. The similarities extend to one key dimension, where at 47 metres, the turbine blades transported by sea and road to Brockaboy are almost exactly the same length as Comanche's mast. As long as we have enough wind to keep rolling, Comanche will, will be in her element. So I don't mind which direction the wind comes from or, or how much there is, as long as there's not too little. The crew and I are very proud of last year's effort. This year we'll be hoping that there's no infringements on the way and um, we'll get there first. The leading boats are already approaching a significant milestone. 
green cape, where every competing yacht makes a mandatory call to radio relay vessel JBW to confirm boat and crew are ready to tackle one of the most infamous stretches of water in the world. The green cape check was introduced so that skippers think about are they ready to go across Bass Strait. Uh, JBW, JBW, this is Ichiban, 4483, over. Uh, affirmative, Ichiban, go ahead. Over the years, some people have said, I think I'll stop here because I'm not right or I've got broken lifelines or I've lost a life raft. The skipper declares that we comply with the requirements of sailing instruction 41 decimal 1 and elects to continue racing, over. It causes you to stop and think. The Green Cape check was one of a series of measures introduced following the 1998 race, in which six sailors were drowned and a further 55 rescued when two storm systems combined near the top of Bass Strait. 20 years on, the fleet better informed and the race much safer, the conditions encountered that year remain fresh in the memories of the survivors. Bass Strait, when it's in a bad way is one of the world's worst stretches of water. It's shallow, you get a compression of current coming down the east coast of Australia, you get a wind out of the south, it just becomes an absolute cauldron. I'd never seen it before, just massive black roll cloud coming from the southwest uh, with lightning bolts, you know, exactly like you'd um, sort of see in some horror movie. Quite a few went for cover then, but we kept going because we thought our best chance, as the breeze got worse and worse, was to keep going into it rather than turning and running. When it did hit, you know, it was for the next virtually 24 hours, I'd say, it was uh, survival time. It was just so much worse than I've ever seen before. Huge waves, 60 foot waves. And so it's just grab the wheel and um, try and do your best before the next one comes. Before you could even see it, you'd hear it like a locomotive off in the distance, this monster wave rolling in at you. And if they broke before you got to the top, you got buried, pushed over the side, get yourself back on board with the tether, the whole cockpit's full of water. Those bad sets that came just let you know that you weren't controlling a situation, it was, it was Mother Nature that was controlling the situation. Now, the declaration you have to make is that the boat's fine, all the safety gear's intact, the radio's working, the crew can carry on, so I think it's a good idea. All in all, there's so many things that have changed, so many things that have been improved as a consequence of that race in 98. Early morning, second day, and the scenario that confronted the fleet in the Bass Strait 20 years ago has thankfully failed to materialise. Enjoying the benign conditions in pursuit of Comanche, the current leader in a fiercely contested line honours battle, is Voodoo, Hugh Ellis's elegant 63-footer from Victoria. Also cutting a dash in their first ever Sydney Hobart is Terence Glacken's crew on American yacht Prospector. But leading the chasing pack is Philip Turner's Alive. The highly competitive entry from Tasmania has already claimed one significant prize in 2018 as first monohull home in the prestigious Rolex China Sea Race. Less than three miles off their stern, though, is Alive's near sister ship, Wild Oats 10, crewed by the outstanding all-women team selected by Stacey Jackson. They're competing as Ocean Respect Racing, confident an impressive result will bring their cause to wider attention. We have two parts to our campaign. First of all, we're here to spread a message. We've teamed up with 11th Hour Racing to spread the need to reduce the use of plastics and to try and look after our ocean's health. At the end of the day, it's a yacht race, and we are in it to win it. Jackson has already completed 11 Sydney Hobarts, and with several Volvo Ocean Race sailors on board, an event in which she herself has competed twice with distinction, she's not short of offshore experience. Well, what we've done this year, we've stepped it up a level and said, well, we're professionals, we all work at the top end of our industry, and we're all going together and we're going to show you the result of what women can achieve in a yacht race. By the afternoon of the second day, the bulk of the fleet is still making their way out into Bass Strait. With difficult transitions ahead of them, they're unlikely to challenge for the overall prize, but stay locked in combat with divisional rivals. 
Near the other end of the fleet, 2017 winners Itchy Barn are also aware of the pitfalls and potholes barring their route to a successful defence of their title. 4.30 in the afternoon on the 27th and uh, here we are in beautiful Bass Strait. We're closing in on the maxi boats, they obviously haven't got much wind in front of them. Still got 240 miles to Tasman Island and uh, it's going to be tricky conditions when we get there in um, late tomorrow afternoon. As day two draws to a close, Comanche still holds a narrow lead on approach to the east coast of Tasmania. But with barely six nautical miles separating all four maxis, the tightest line on us battle for years is reaching a critical stage. We're uh, east of Tasmania now, and uh, we're on our final approach to, uh, to Tasman Lake, close to 20 knots. But by the looks of the forecast, it's going to get tricky as we get to uh, Tasman Lake, so we'll see. The windless zone south of Tasman Island is the biggest cloud on the horizon, but it's here at around 4 a.m. that Wild Oats 11 outmaneuvers Comanche, positioning themselves further out to pick up the first of the new southwesterly breeze. By first light on day three, Mark Richards' crew has moved into the lead and is picking their way past the distinctive landmarks of the South Tasmanian coast. Behind them, Blackjack has also managed to slip past Comanche and into second place. Last year's winner fatally short of breeze when she needed it most. Across Storm Bay, Wild Oats 11 manages to extend her lead and in a steadily building breeze, prepares to make a triumphant entry to the Derwent River. To accompany her on the last few miles of her journey, a spectator fleet has been congregating dutifully since dawn ready to usher her over the line. After one day, 19 hours and seven minutes, Wild Oats 11 crosses the finish line off Constitution Dock in Hobart to earn her ninth Line Honours title. Back down the river, Jim Cooney's crew on Comanche regains second place, only to lose it again in the few miles that remain. After the crushing disappointment of last year's race, there's relief for Mark Richards. And redemption. It's an unbelievably uh, you know, tightly fought contest by all four boats. And, um, Mate, we, uh, the guys just did an awesome job and to be here you know, in this position today is just a wonderful feeling, so couldn't be happier. But as second place Blackjack docks, a dark cloud arrives with her, threatening to rain on Oates' parade. Owner Peter Harburg claims Richard's crew may have broken the rules by racing without their AIS tracking system turned on. Could the Wild Oats skipper and his team be facing a crew repeat of last year's result and see the title taken from them a second time? With all four maxis across the line in little more than 40 minutes and the ramifications of Black Jack's claims still unclear, the focus switches back to the dispute for fifth place and, potentially, the overall title. The duel between Wild Oats 10 and Alive has endured all race. And as the two 66-footers make the turn at the tip of Tasman Island, Stacey Jackson's crew only holds a slender advantage. But across Storm Bay and into the Derwent, Philip Turner's Tasmanian team slides past in a determined dash for home. They finish at 2.40 in the afternoon, less than six hours after the last of the maxis, and just 30 minutes ahead of their rivals on Wild Oats 10, both boats arriving to an enthusiastic welcome. Matt Allen's Itchy Barn remains the most likely challenger. Down to 32nd overall at one point, she has scrambled back up the leaderboard, but still has her work cut out. We've got to finish by 19 minutes past nine p.m. tonight. Live's finished, so she's the clubhouse leader. So uh, the pace is on. The problem we've got is the weather. 
Alan's crew enters the Derwent just three minutes ahead of schedule, but when the light and the breeze fade, their hopes of securing a second overall victory die with them. Slipping agonizingly slowly out of contention, they eventually finish fifth on corrected time. While Oates 11 survived one of the most dramatic finishes in Sydney to Hobart history, and this afternoon she survived a protest to strip her of that victory. The fate of Wild Oats 11 is of national interest, and when the protest brought by the race committee is ruled invalid by the international jury, a skipper's reaction is headline news. We're very happy with the decision, obviously. I think common sense has prevailed, and um, but, you know, an unfortunate situation. It was a fantastic race. We respected the decision last year, and we respect the decision this year. We're just happy with the result, and uh, very happy to be celebrating our ninth win. Out on the racetrack, there's one final hurdle for the smaller boats to negotiate. The winds pick up on the final run home, and a more traditional Sydney Hobart briefly returns. End of day four, Constitution Dock is filling up with returning boats and tired but happy crews. For some, a long-held ambition realised. For others, just another memorable entry for the logbook. This is the race of the world, for, particularly for amateurs. It, it's, it's fantastic. Big winds, big seas, so that was the real Hobart experience, you know, that's what we come here for. Wasn't expecting the reception, this was uh, quite spectacular. Escape with our life and have a lot of fun smile at the end of it all. <laughs> Alive's position at the top of the overall leaderboard proves unassailable. Owner Philip Turner and skipper Duncan Hine duly received the Tattersall Cup, awarded to the winner on corrected time. Their crew, only the fourth Tasmanian entry to triumph in 74 editions of the race. Three cheers for the Tasmanian pocket maxi alive. Hip hip! Hip hip! At the official prize giving, Mark Richards steps up on behalf of his team on Wild Oats 11. Their long wait to reclaim the Line Honours title finally over. Next time on Spirit of Yachting, we head for the south of France and the self-styled queen of the Mediterranean, the Rolex Giralia.